Nargis Kasenova, and I'm a senior um, senior fellow at the Davis Center for Russian and Eurasian Studies, running its program on Central Asia. Since last year, we've been hosting uh, a series of talks and roundtables on uh, China's Belt and Road Initiative and governance in Central Asia and beyond. And we would be really amazed if we didn't try to have a good discussion on crony capitalism and how it fuels and hinders uh, Belt and Road Initiative. Uh, China's expansion and readiness to invest means that there is a lot of money around um, and uh, available, which is highly attractive to governments and businesses. However, lack of proper procedures, transparency, accountability, also lacking capacity to make good decisions and flow them through in many developing states um, make some deals easier to push through on the one hand, that is, um, that fuels them. On the other, um, that makes them dysfunctional and result in failure and sometimes public scandal. Among recent examples of that in Central Asia is the suspension of the um, LRT, a light rail transit project in North Sultan due to big sums of money um, just, well, coming from the Chinese loans, disappearing in fraud schemes organized by city officials. So to understand what's going on, how crony capitalism and uh, BRI relate to each other, what can be done about it, uh, we have this discussion today with the best people in the field. Uh, we're very happy to have with us Alexander Cooley, who is the Claire Tao Professor of Political Science at Barnett College and Director of Columbia's Harriman Institute. Professor Cooley's research examines how external actors, including emerging powers, international organizations, multinational companies, and NGOs have influenced the development, governance, and sovereignty of the former Soviet states with a focus on Central Asia and the Caucasus. Uh, Kuli is the author and or editor of seven academic books, including Great Games, Local Rules, The New Great Power Contest in Central Asia, and Dictators Without Borders, Power and Money in uh, Central Asia. And these two books, they are must have for anybody who is studying Central Asia. Uh, his new book, Exit from Hegemony, The Unraveling of the American Global Order, has just been published by Oxford University Press in April 2020. Thank you for joining us, Alex. We also, have with us, we also have with us Jonathan Hillman, who is a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and International Studies and director of Reconnecting Asia Project, one of the most extensive open source databases tracking China's Belt and Road Initiative, which is a fantastic, fantastic project. Thank you very much for it, Jonathan. Prior to joining CSIS, Hillman served as a policy advisor at the Office of the U.S. Trade Representative, where he contributed to the um, 2015 U.S. National Security Strategy and the President's Trade Agenda, and directed the research and writing process for essays, speeches, and other materials explaining U.S. trade and investment policy. He has also worked as a researcher at the Harvard Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs, the Council on Foreign Relations, and in Kyrgyzstan as a Fulbright Scholar. And his book, The Emperor's New Road, will be published uh, by Yale University Press this year. So um, welcome, uh, welcome, John. So uh, first I want to turn to you, um, Alex. Um, well, crony capitalism is quite a prominent feature in uh, Central Asian political economy, as we know. Uh, how does it work and what can be done? Let me- Argus, yeah, thanks so much for the invitation. It's a true pleasure to be here with you. And I would sort of put you in the pantheon of experts of China and Central Asia. So it's a real pleasure to share the space with you and with Jonathan, of course. So I do have a PowerPoint Prepared. Yes, I'm um, on, just one. and my um, sort of my you know my idea behind this 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 briefing was to point to a little bit of what crony capitalism through some revealed um, um, indicators and also experiences look like right up to the Belt and Road, uh, and then think about how then the Belt and Road might be reconfigured, network structured, um, going through based on. I would say a good, you know, 25 years um, of experiences in, in the independent era. And I do think that we see some patterns. So next slide. Um, some of these examples you'll find in this book with, with John Heathershaw, especially when we talk about uh, some of the offshore dimensions of these uh, uh, grand corruption schemes. Uh, next book, and uh, next slide. So uh, the, the, the really big assumption I want to tackle today is this dominant assumption 
um, prevalent both in Western and in Chinese circles that uh, Central Asia and Central Asian political economy uh, lacked connectivity, right? Um, this idea that the region has been kept isolated either because of its sort of Soviet legacy uh, or the fact that these countries are uh, uh, relatively autarkic, some of them, especially Uzbekistan um, and, and, and Turkmenistan, and they lack global connections, right? Uh, so I want to discuss this connectivity issue, then I want to talk a little bit about some of the informal barriers to connectivity, and then finally I want to give a few examples of grand corruption. So uh, next slide. So one of the biggest buzzwords, especially during the Obama era, was this idea of connectivity. And there were a number of drivers of this, right? One was the idea equating that the lack of physical infrastructure in Central Asia, especially cross-regional, um, was also hindering its access to global markets, right? And creating new trading relations. So we saw um, U.S. officials uh, uh, adopt this kind of connectivity first approach, as we see, that culminated in Secretary of State Hillary Clinton announcing plans for a new Silk Route. Now, this was always aspirational. The funding behind it wasn't, didn't match the grand ambition. It included projects that were already slated, like the Casa Energy Production Project or, or TAPI. Um, but what struck me at the time, and even more so now, was a very kind of depoliticized notion of connectivity. This was just about infrastructure. This was just about creating connections. And of course, the drivers behind this were numerous. One was the idea of connecting Afghanistan to Central Asia and part of that endeavor. The second was orienting or reorienting the region away from Soviet and Russian-led infrastructural legacies. Um, and in this way, the connectivity agenda of a greater Central Asia was aligned with Chinese plans. And in fact, US officials were very supportive of Chinese plans, especially to go west, um, Central Asian gas pipelines, and, and all of the, the, the plans that sort of predate the formal announcement of uh, the Belt and Road. But the two agendas were relatively aligned. That's, that's my point here. Next slide. But I will always say that these assumptions were always flawed, that there was a conflation of the idea of geographical connectivity and sort of economic uh, and legal connectivity, right? Uh, and of course, um, this kind of attempt to present kind of the great gains, not great games dimension, um, to me was in part driven by this withdrawal from Afghanistan and the need to signal that Central Asia was going to be okay as that we were going to sort of foster and network it across the region. Next slide. But I think my analytical point remains. Has the developmental, the main developmental problem in Central Asia, is it the lack of connectivity, however we define it, or rather is it too much kleptocracy? Elites monopolizing state resources, then engaging, uh, getting their uh, profits and proceeds out via capital flight, and then plugging into this world of global enablers. Um, in other words, is it lack of connectivity or too much of the wrong types of connectivity that has created these kinds of um, kleptocratic features? Um, at some point, though, we conflated the two, right? We thought increasing trade and investment, right, would actually lead to greater regional commerce. So this is a chart of uh, constructed from um, uh, trade uh, with China and trade with Russia. As you see, even in 2001, trade levels with China very, very low. This is 2001, by the way, not 91. $1 billion total trade volume. And this is from official statistics, so it's underreported. And look how it explodes. By 2013, you have 50 times more trade. Next slide. However, both this increased trade, and we do another slide of the European Union that would be similar, increased trade from outside has actually not improved border informality and governance, right? So Russia has tried, the EU has tried, the US has tried, and all of these externally posed sort of regional development connective schemes haven't actually uh, improved micro level governance. This is a slide with data compiled from the ease of doing business indicators on import export times. And as you can see, Central Asia has not significantly uh, improved, did not significantly improve between 2006 and 2014, um, the start of the Belt and Road. And in fact, when you compare to these other regions, Eastern Europe, Latin America, MENA, South Asia, Central Asia has the worst informal trade barriers and controls in the world. So if you're peaking a region in the world where you wanted to reignite the Silk Route, 
I would submit probably Central Asia wouldn't be the um, ideal candidate. So the sort of external imposition hasn't led to these improvements. Next slide. But we also get into what I consider to be the particular hallmarks of these corruption networks. We tend to think of corruption as uh, managed with something that happens within a country that we kind of assess it and rank it. But in reality, what we see in Central Asia is, yes, we see these domestic actors, politicians, regulators, businessmen who take bribes, but we see all sorts of other elements of the network, the international official actors, the brokers, the foreign nationals who uh, facilitate these transactions, the aggressive use of offshore vehicles to hide and camouflage these transactions, and then a whole host of Western, what we call enablers, bankers, real estate brokers, lawyers, public relations agencies that then recast the finances and reputations of these Central Asian elites as they live and reside abroad. Next slide. So three, and this is sort of an example of uh, of a contemporary kleptocrat, even though they might or originate in a transaction or uh, originates in China, uh, they might get the offshore company from a wholesale uh, 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 dealer in Panama that then features individual shell companies from the BVI that then they open bank accounts in Switzerland to purchase property in the US. So this is a very simple scheme. This is very typical of how money moves. Next. So I wanna do three very short case studies to illustrate these kinds of networks, right? So the first one is actually kind of a, a, a maybe a little bit of a, 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 a exceptional one, but I think it holds for the general pattern. And that was some of the offshore fuel selling schemes that emerge to support US military operations in Kyrgyzstan at the Manas base. Manas was used between 2001, 2014 as a staging post into Afghanistan. Next slide. So every day, Manas required three Olympic uh, swimming pools worth of aviation jet fuel, right? So where are you going to get this jet fuel? Kyrgyzstan is landlocked. Uh, where can it be sourced? Um, and as it turns out, next slide, a couple of very mysterious companies popped up. Um, the latest, which first Red Star, then Mina Store. Mina, Mina Corps. These companies had no previous corporate histories. They were registered offshore in Gibraltar, and they won a series of non-tendered bids to provide jet fuels, right? And we've seen allegations uh, made by Kyrgyz politicians that they were schemes um, from which to institutionalize corruption uh, and bribe the ruling family, first the Kiev and then the Bakievs into accepting the US base. Next slide. Really, and next slide, here you see the no bid, next slide. Um, a congressional investigation actually discovered the following. Mina was getting its jet fuel actually from Omsk in Siberia, and it was being facilitated by a series of falsified papers on the Russian and the Kyrgyz side that specified that this was for civilian use, not for uh, military use, right? So everyone was in on it. Even while the Russians were trying to publicly close the base, in private, we had these fuel scheme, uh, dealing schemes. Next slide. And this is a chart I made up at sort of the different layers of companies transacting to get the fuel to Gazprom, oil, Aero in the end. Um, and at each stage, people took greater and greater cuts. Next slide. So two other short examples. The second one, Gulnara Karimova, former first daughter of Uzbekistan's president, uh, implicated in a series of telecom scandals um, where she shook down three prominent international telecommunications companies in exchange for granting 3G licenses to operate in Uzbekistan in the 2000s. Um, I would not, I'll not get into the details of these schemes for time, but I will just say these three companies, MTS, Telia, Vimpacom, have signed amongst the largest settlements in FCPA history uh, with the DOJ and the SEC. And we now have a wealth of information of how these schemes were conducted, but very similarly, a Gibraltar registered uh, shell company became the main vehicle through which, next slide, companies like Terlia created these sequenced kickback schemes um, to repurchase shares of these subsidiary and then with links to the Karimov uh, family. Um, and then the final example I have is from a Chinese project, pre-Belt and Road anyway, but this project should, I think, have given us pause as to some of the schemes that uh, might be cooked up with the Belt and Road. Um, this regards China's funding, Dushanbei Chanak Highway, um, that weeks, this is a highway that connects the country east-west, plugs into also China. Um, 
And this was built with a Chinese assistance uh, project, 80% of, of, of the money uh, 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 from uh, uh, Chinese official sources. Weeks after opening, uh, toll booths emerge on this road. And this company called Innovative Road Solutions, IRS, that's registered in the British Virgin Islands, um, starts collecting toll booths on the road. As it turns out, Tajik investigative reporters find out that IRS has links to the president's son-in-law um, and no previous corporate history, uh, no um, uh, sense of what the revenues are or sort of reporting on these. So what we saw is that these local actors via these kinds of transnational links created a private revenue stream using Chinese aid and assistance. And the kicker on this particular project is that Tajikistan rejected a World Bank project that would have included economic conditions and went with the Chinese option instead. Final slide. So where does this leave us? Um, I wouldn't argue that infrastructure investment has always been nested with broader geopolitics. There's no such thing as depoliticized investment, right, in infrastructure. It doesn't mean that it's not necessary, that it's not desirable, that governed and managed the right way, it won't be of an economic benefit. But it is a sense to say that this kind of attempt to depoliticize connectivity completely ignored governance issue and the very specific types of transnational grand corruption schemes that link Central Asian predatory and connected elites to the sort of um, the world. A couple of the recommendations um, I've pushed in some of my own work, one is uh, to uh, create more competency and understanding in civil society, democratic Watchdog has required training in anti-money laundering, anti-bribery procedures and checks, uh, demands for uh, national registries of projects, especially Chinese projects, so that those are available, that they can be followed uh, by local reporters. Um, and then a kind of a more idiosyncratic recommendation, and that is Western companies, and really all companies, um, um, that operate in Central Asia and that bid in our award tender should make their due diligence reports public right? The diligence that they undertake um, regarding conditions uh, uh, in the area, uh, uh, because then those are the basis for sort of understanding and shareholder understanding of whether there was sufficient attempts to guard and put uh, 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 checks uh, uh, um, around project risk in this area. So, uh, so my own sense is this is what uh, China is plugging into, and I'm looking forward to your discussion, of course, Jonathan, on on, on what they see in the region. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Alex. Two immediate questions. Uh, first, you mentioned geopolitics. Now there are a number of uh, initiatives uh, by uh, various actors. Um, well, the EU has a connectivity strategy. Japan has uh, a much better funded um, uh, quality infrastructure uh, also uh, initiative and uh, well, the US is trying to do something. Uh, what do you think about that? What are the, uh, the prospects of these initiatives? And can they help to improve governance? Uh, that would, would be the first question. And the second question, uh, you mentioned um, society, civil society. Uh, on the one hand, yes, uh, the transparency of Chinese uh, projects is low, especially at the initial stages. Uh, uh, as actually John Yu pointed out in your testimony to the uh, to one of the Congress committees, which I reread for the <laughs> reread for the discussion. Um, but at the same time, there is more public attention to the Chinese yes. project because because you know from the very beginning people are suspicious. So can can that sort of counterbalance and help? It's a great point and it's exactly on the money. I think there's a particular opening in both, I would say Kazakh and Kyrgyz media to be able to cover Chinese corruption stories, right? And they're always covered from the sort of perspective that, well, uh, you know, these Chinese companies or Chinese schemes roped our politicians into doing it, right? I mean, that's, yeah. that's the kind of, you know, uh, tone that these stories take. But yes, you're right. There is an opportunity to report these. What's not still happening is getting um, good ingrained understanding of um, um, uh, how these Chinese schemes um, operate. Yes, there have been scandals. There have been protests against sort of, you know, the power plant in Bishkek, for instance. Um, um, and, you know, and, and of course, you know, the light rail in, in Kazakhstan. Uh, but I think uh, uh, it's kind of, you know, a more systematic engagement to the fact that um, you know, it's okay to demand transparency of uh, 
these various sort of Chinese efforts in the same way as um, you would from um, other sort of external actors or Western external actors coming in. And I think that kind of civil society link is still underdeveloped. Um, there's still, I think, a fear in civil society about openly discussing and going after particular uh, Chinese projects. Um, and, and, and I think that that can be worked on, that can be uh, um, encouraged. In terms of sort of, you know, you know, the other competitors getting in, I think John's group has done an amazing job sort of showing the different, um, you know, project schemes and, 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 and sort of, you know, the map according to Japan and Korea and all these, you know, Russia and all these great players. Um, I would add, I'm actually a little more pessimistic on this because I feel like the presence of multiple donors encourages domestic actors to actually play them off one another rather than adopt um, actual, um, you, know, uh, 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 you know, governance improvements. So, um, you know, my sense is it, it tends to follow, and we have some empirical evidence of this from Africa and the aid data, uh, that places where you have a lot of competing sort of external actors, you tend to get a race to the bottom dynamic as opposed to sort of rising up. But, you know, certainly I hope I'm proved wrong, but it's this kind of local agency and leveraging the availability of another patron, I think that empowers them um, to, you know, to push back against some of the conditions that they don't like. John, I would want to ask you this question too. Maybe you can answer it now. What would you prefer? Sure, I'm happy to. Uh, you know, I, I and, and Alex, um, was very helpful um, very early on, actually, with our Reconnecting Asia project, did some um, some writing. And we really, you know, the, the way I look at a lot of this has been informed by his work. Um, and I think it's important to remember, as he's pointing out here, there's a longer history here, you know, Belt and Road, not the, not the world's first connectivity infrastructure heavy effort. Um, in fact, we could go way back, we could go back to, you know, Western powers building infrastructure into um, territory to try to control it. Um, and there's been a lot that has been learned from all of those mistakes. Um, I, I think to your question of these competing initiatives right now, what I think is positive from the U.S. perspective is, perspective is we've, it's taken us a while, but we're slowly moving towards saying, um, from only saying what we're against to saying what we support. Um, it sounds kind of obvious, but um, for a while, I mean, it's very easy to criticize. It's much harder to offer alternatives. I think Japan got there a little bit faster with its quality infrastructure program um, and, and has been involved, you, the U.S. has been involved in this as well, um, convincing the G20 to adopt principles around quality infrastructure. Um, now, if you look at the principles, they're very hard to disagree with. It's aspirational language it's also very difficult to apply them in practice. So I think there's more work that needs to be done to take the principles and, and make them easier to, to apply. Um, and I, you know, I, I take Alex's point about um, the um, sort of the recipient countries often, I think are often overlooked as being frankly, the most important and influential actors in all of this. Um, but I do, I, am, I do think that when there is, when there are competing offers, um, at least that can, that can, um, that competition can sometimes promote, um, it, can, it can reduce the degree to which projects are inflated. Um, so there is some healthy, I think, results that can come out of that. Um, again, it's all context dependent. Um, so that's, that's sort of, uh, slightly more optimistic, but again, I do, I do really think it's the recipient countries here um, are, are the most influential. Thank, thank you very much. Now let's, uh, let's move to your presentation. If I can especially, oh, I think I pressed something wrong. Just a second. Yes, I did press something wrong. Um, so, well, while I'm trying to switch on the, uh, the slides, oh God. Um, okay, while I'm trying to switch on the slides. The slides are nice to have too. We can, we can, we can no, get no, no, started. No, 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 I just pressed something wrong. Okay, 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 I'm back. <laughs> Just one second, give me one second. But uh, sure. well, um, maybe while I'm switching on the uh, the slides, um, 
Uh -huh. What do you think was going? What will be the effect of uh, COVID nineteen? You're saying on uh, and all this connectivity business. Um, well, so I think I think at least on the Belt and Road side, there's been a pretty dramatic slowdown in activity. Um, that's something that the Chinese have even started to try to release some statistics about that, and I find that interesting because, um, you know, it's not as if the Belt and Road was thriving before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. There already was a slowdown. So I think there's a little bit of op opportunism here where they're taking advantage of this and saying, you know, it's, it's the pandemic that's really brought this to a halt. Um, I think it's a combination of things. Uh, I think we're likely to see um, for several reasons, even more of an emphasis on digital infrastructure going mm -hmm. forward. Um, those projects, I'm talking about things like um, uh, wireless networks, um, uh, data centers, smart city projects or safe city projects as they're often advertised by the Chinese companies. They, they're still expensive, but they cost less than major transport and energy projects, which could be a little more appealing in the financial environment that we're in now. They require fewer workers. Um, and I think that's also has its appeals. Um, and meanwhile, as Chinese companies are getting squeezed out of some Western markets, I think this is, that's another driver for them to intensify those activities. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess they're less lucrative uh, than big, hard, hard infrastructure projects, uh, but uh, but I guess there are other incentives for, for doing them, especially in authoritarian countries. Uh, okay, I think I have I have your slides on. Finally, Great. sorry, uh, problem. Yeah, so just just briefly, what I'd like to try to do here is. Um, I'd like to kind of tackle the question to what extent is what China is doing different from others, um, because. Mm -hmm. China, again, not the, only, um, not the only actor with a vision for connectivity, not the only one pursuing projects beyond its borders. Um, and this is the, what we're looking at now is an um, interactive map that we have at reconnectingasia.csis.org. And we're tracking more than, we've been tracking more than just um, Chinese funded projects. And um, I can sort of make a few comparisons um, using the data that, that we have. Obviously, we spend a lot more time tracking Chinese projects, both because um, of, of the scale of, of what they're up to, as well as the difficulty of, of pulling together the information. Um, so let's, why don't we um, go to the next slide? And, and this is a sample project page. We've got a little over 14,000 projects in our database. Again, not all of them are Belt and Road projects. I don't want people to think um, that this is you know, that that's how many Belt and Road projects there are. We're, our, our geographic scope is also the Eurasian supercontinent. There's plenty of activity happening in Africa, Latin America, and elsewhere, um, but that's been our, our focus. Um, and what you see in this example is, um, you know, a project with uh, just some fundamental information missing. This is something that we come across that's really quite common. It probably took in this case, a decent amount of time to track down the, the reported cost from uh, maybe a local, a local language news source or maybe a government announcement. Um, having invested that time though, we still don't know who the contractor is for the project when this was put together. Um, and this is something that we come across quite often um, and something that I think does distinguish China's um, approach to these projects from how other, um, especially multilateral institutions have approached these projects. They just do not make as much information publicly available. Were you to look at this project um, or an equivalent, you know, a road project supported by the World Bank or the Asian Development Bank, um, the challenge would be you'd be almost overwhelmed with information. You'd see all the project documentation, you'd see the environmental risk assessments, you would see um, uh, social impact assessments, um, you know, just the, that does not exist for the vast majority of, of these Belt and Road projects. So I think that is, that's one important um, distinguishing factor. Um, if we go to the next slide, um, another, something else that's interesting that jumps out of our data is that the projects that we do know about from the largest Chinese actors um, China Development Bank being one of them, China Exim Bank being another. Um, we often find out about them much later in the project um, cycle. So yeah, this is 
this is again just sort of illustrating you know you'll, you'll you know you know about a multilateral bank project closer to as it's being conceived and announced um, and that matters because the earlier you know about it the more opportunity there is for others to be involved in the process to compete if there is an opportunity to compete um, for for contracts for involvement in the process um, and so what we're seeing with a lot of the Belt and Road projects is when you find out about them, they're further along. Um, and so the, the, the room for participation has already been um, limited. Um, and if we go to the next slide. I think it's, it's worth asking, um, you know, why, why are Chinese projects less transparent? I, I don't think it's a mistake. Um, they could release more information if they wanted to. And so I think it's worth asking who benefits from that lack of transparency. Um, this, this is, I think, one indication um, of, of who benefits from that. And this is a comparison, again, between a set of multilateral bank projects and a set of Chinese funded projects. And you see in the set of Chinese funded projects, the vast majority of the contractors are Chinese companies. Um, this doesn't capture subcontracting that happens after they get the, the, the major contract. And that's an important part of the story. Um, and it also shows you how competitive Chinese companies are, even in the, in the multilateral development bank process, still getting, you know, 29%. Um, I think this was, this was focused on energy and transport projects. So those are two areas where these Chinese companies are very competitive. Um, but again, this is, this is a, a difference. Um, it's a difference in approach often using Chinese contractors is tied to um, whether or not you want to take Chinese funding. It's a, you know, often a requirement. Um, and it goes at odd. It's at odds certainly with the rhetoric that Chinese officials use to describe the Belt and Road as, as being win-win um, and, and the sort of the less involvement of local companies, the less opportunity they have not only to benefit commercially, but in some cases to, you know, build the capacity that they want um, that's often promised by local politicians as a, as one of the benefits of doing these projects. You know, not only will they have immediate benefits for you know connecting point A and point B, but we will develop the local um, skill set and capacity of of our own. Um, and so, I think to the extent this is dominated even more by um, Chinese contractors, those opportunities can be more limited. Um, if we go to the next slide. You know, I, 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 I think that the Belt and Road um, is, I think this is a set of problems that is uh, exacerbated because of the Belt and Road scale. And so, you know, I, I want to be, I want to um, sort of acknowledge that, you know, corruption with large projects is not something, again, that's unique to China. Um, you know, I grew up outside Boston. We had something called the Big Dig that um, I think people refer to as, you know, the most, the, the most expensive highway robbery. Um, and, you know, you see this is a universal challenge. I think one scholar has actually listed 13 ways in which large projects um, promote um, or facilitate, can facilitate corruption, everything ranging from you know, the number of linkages with the actors to the project complexity, the involvement of government officials. Um, so the Belt and Road, by virtue of focusing so heavily on these large projects, is a perfect vehicle for this. Um, so that's something that's sort of just characteristic of, of the effort um, itself. But I think what's remarkable is that seeing as these are not new issues, again, these are things that are well, these are documented challenges. China has done very little to address them. Um, so at the last Belt and Road Forum um, in 2019, Xi Jinping said, uh, we should have zero tolerance for corruption. He said, we will adopt widely accepted rules for project development and procurement and tendering. Um, and what he did um, to support that is he unveiled something called the Beijing Initiative for Clean Silk Road. Um, and I'm honestly, I'm not sure really what it's done. Um, this is something that countries, I, you know, I think have, some of them have elected to sign up to. It just includes aspirational language. There are no consequences or enforcement mechanisms um, and in the meantime, the, this basic problem of lack of transparency for projects uh, continues. And so very basic things like the MOUs that are signed and so often publicized by the Chinese 
Many, mo most of them remain unavailable publicly. Um, the ones that we've seen publicly, um, you know, some of them look pretty meaningless and empty. And some of, the, some of them even say, this is not a legally binding document. So it's a very low bar to release those is what I'm saying. And the fact that the, govern the governments have been reluctant to do that, I think is telling. Um, beyond you know, the, the, the direct benefits to the state-owned enterprises, which I think, I think Chinese state-owned enterprises are probably, after the recipient countries, probably the most influential actors. Um, they're the biggest ben beneficiaries of the Belt and Road. In many cases on the ground, they're more influential than the government than the Chinese government that's supposed to be supervising them. They have often more funding, more expertise. They'll propose unsolicited projects. They will do the feasibility studies for their own projects. Um, and some of them have been suspended from the World Bank, um, but that's not what, that would be a much more serious consequence if there was no Belt and Road as a sort of safety net for them. Um, so I think that the lack of transparency exists in large part because the state-owned enterprises um, don't want more oversight. Um, so I think that's probably one of the most important drivers to think about. And then you could, you could think about a set of strategic considerations as well. Um, you know, the, the lack of scrutiny allows China to use these projects to make friends in high places. Um, there were examples certainly of that in Pakistan, um, you know, allowing um, incumbent um, governments to announce projects in the run-up to elections. Um, in that case, it didn't work actually, but there was an attempt. Um, and, and bribery and corruption can also provide leverage in the future. Um, you know, if the, the China in these cases is certainly the stronger party um, and, and is going to weather an allegation, whereas a recipient um, country, the, the incumbent may not. And so I think that gives China, again, some additional leverage. And finally, hiding details, I do think, can make it um, easier. And I don't think that this is a widespread um, occurrence, but in the handful of cases in which projects really are, do have a um, dual use purpose, you know, they do have a purpose and it's not economic, um, then I think you know, hiding the details makes it more difficult to, uh, to suss that out. Um, so why don't I pause there? And I, you know, I am interested in talking about the solutions as well. Um, I don't want to just um, don't want to only point and sort of admire the problem here. But let me pause there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, John. Um, well, you, you you showed that that the big percentage of uh, of contracts in China funded projects go to Chinese companies. To what extent do you think it's an element of the tight aid? And to what extent, you know, it's uh, it's crony uh, crony capitalism because tie date is not something you know that the China is the first to do. Um, Japan did it. Japan did tie date, and they graduated out of it. Uh, what are the prospects of China? You know, is there a chance that China will graduate out of it as well? I think it's a great question, and I think that the Japanese experience could be instructive. Um, I think I think you know it, it is very interesting if you look at the 1980s and Japan's infrastructure activities, particularly in Southeast Asia, there was a lot of concern, a lot of criticism about um, you know, requiring Japanese companies do the work, um, that Japan was lending at interest rates that were too high. Um, and even the words predatory were used by um, uh, US uh, uh, congressmen at the time. So this was something you know, that I think was really, was criticized, a few parallels there. Um, and Japan weathered some corruption scandals. When, when the um, president of the Philippines fled office, um, there, was, you know, a cake, uh, there was a large amount of documents that implicated um, Japanese companies um, in, in corruption. And I think how Japan responded to that, though, is instructive. Um, you know, the Japanese um, diet passed legislation that, um, you know, that, that targeted this. This was something that was very embarrassing. It was taken very seriously. Um, and so I think that the lesson there is that this is also, um, those reforms were done, you know, not only out of goodwill, but out of self-interest uh, to protect, you know, their, their financial and, um, status and their reputation. And so I, I do think that um, it is in China's own interest to move in that direction. 
And the question is whether or not it needs to suffer more financial reputational costs before it does that. And what role can markets play? I mean, market discipline and, you know, kind of credit ratings and these kind of, these kind of things in your view. Well, I think that, you know, the Belt and Road's going into some very risky places even before the pandemic, um, you know, to, to yeah. places where, you know, credit was, there's often no rating for, you know, the, the country's credit. And so um, there's been certainly a, a really high appetite uh, for risk that might change a little bit. Um, I think right now, honestly, it's, it's tough to know how many white elephant projects are roaming the Belt and Road. But I do think we'll, we'll get a better sense for that in the coming months as many of the recipient countries um, face, face uh, these financial challenges. Right, right. Um, okay, uh, we started getting questions. And the first questions, question is for Alex. Um, is there evidence to suggest corruptive convergence between Central Asian and Chinese elites to the extent that Central Asian elites have converged with actors in Russia? Can you, okay, I, I got the first part of that. Can you just add the, the, the second clause of that, right? Uh, so oh, at least is convergence, that, yeah. yes, that convergence between Central Asian yeah. and Chinese elites is to the same level as that convergence with Russian, um, with Russian actors. Well, I think, look, a, a couple, it's, it's an important question, a, a couple of thoughts, right? One is we don't, you know, first a methodological point. We only know about corruption when it's, in, it's revealed right, these grand schemes. And, you know, so there's, there's, a, there's a heavy kind of sort of, you know, selection bias here. Like we see glimpses and snapshots of scandals, but we usually do it in response to a whistleblower or very frankly, someone with a politically motivated agenda exposing the thing, right? Mm -hmm. So um, um, the other thing that we see is sort of, you know, realms of international investigative reporting pulling on the seams outside of the country rather than inside the country, right? Going in some ways backwards from the sort of attempt to launder these proceeds back to the original schemes, right? That's the vulnerability. So the way we know about this is, is, is very, you know, is very fraught and problematic. Um, we know more about Chinese projects and their problems and scandals than we do about Russian ones, right? And that is, an absolute axiom still going after Russian corruption scandals remains very much taboo, you know, and some consider it to be dangerous even in terms of sort of you know, civil society and media coverage and so forth. With all those caveats, um, I think you've seen some of the cross, uh, um, you, know, you know, the cross implication of scandals, um, the CNPC corruption scandal um, that so consumed China um, implicated the head of Turkmenistan operations and also the head of sort of Kazakhstan uh, mm -hmm. operations there. Um, so, you know, um, um, the, 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 uh, you know the, the convergence, I'm not sure it's so much of a convergence as, as just, you know, network sort of, you know, you know crisscrossing uh, when it's opportune for, you know, for them to do so. So it's more international. Yeah, international networks. And yeah, I, 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 I would say so. I would say so. Yeah. And I think, um, you know, again, it, you know, it depends on, you know, the scale of the project and the scheme. But I think one of the potential vulnerability of Chinese companies is this kind of axiomatic belief almost that a lot of the a lot of corruptions is sort of like a deadweight loss. It's like a write off. Right. They fully anticipate it. They budget for it. Even they expect it but then not sort of fully sort of looking at the second and third order effects. And even though the scheme itself might be quiet and under wraps within the country, there are enough places of vulnerability in this grand scheme of things that it still might be exposed going forward. And you've <laughs> seen that in places like Djibouti and Sri Lanka and so forth um, with the major sort of scandals that were sort of uncovered there. So, uh, 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 you know, there's, I think Jonathan's point about sort of time delay is really important. Like sometimes a lot of information about these projects blows up as a result of someone sort of pulling on that thread, which then leads to a kind of a reconsideration of the project or even a particular sector in the country. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much. And uh, I think it's an excellent point on, uh, well, 
Russian uh, Russian corruption schemes being much more in the shadow, and uh, that's something we saw with the uh, land protests that broke out in Kazakhstan in 2016 because you know the the, uh, the legislation changed and uh, the terms of rent were were increased, and people were afraid that the um, Chinese companies will be renting. They already rented out too much of uh, Kazakh land, and then uh, and then it turned out that actually Russian companies land much more. Uh, much more of the of Kazakhstan's land than than Chinese companies. Uh, so, okay, um, and that's def definitely something also to discuss. Um, a question uh, for uh, Jonathan: uh, Could the discrepancy between Chinese and multilateral projects transparency be due to different disclosure regulations? And maybe we can talk a bit more on standards uh, in general. Great. So, if I understand it, the the question is about Sort of why why do we see that that big difference between the, the mm -hmm. amount of information that's disclosed? Um, I mean, I, th I think that the I think that the Chinese um, lenders could do that if they wanted to. Um, I think they could disclose more details. Um, it, there's there are two sides to this, right? And and I don't want to pin the blame entirely on you know China Exim Bank, China Development Bank, because the people on the other end of the deal often don't want you know all of the details too. Um, but I think until those lenders see it in their own best interest to release more of those details, um, I think it's, it's hard to see how you get much more transparency. Um, you know, I, I, there's maybe one other scenario that I could imagine, which is recipient countries sharing information among each other, um, which is, which is, you know, there are informal ways in which that already happens. I wonder if there could be sort of more institutionalized ways to allow them to do that, um, to sort of have the information they need to be their own best advocates. Mm -hmm. There have been a few examples um, over railway projects, for example, in Southeast Asia, where country A finds out that country B got a better interest rate. Um, and all of a sudden that's their new bargaining position. And so it just, sh it shows you the power of, um, you know, of having that information available. Um, it, it really does strengthen the recipient's bargaining position um, so I, I, it's worth thinking about ways that we might be able to improve that as well, in addition to any kind of, you know, regulatory reform that you could require, um, mm -hmm. again, probably more likely on the recipient country side than the Chinese side. Um, if I could just yes, one yes, follow please. up on this um, that I think is quite, quite interesting and relevant, uh, you know, in many parts of the world, um, you know, Chinese, you know, development actors, um, are pressured into attending donor coordination meetings, right? Certain parts of Africa, um, you know, for example, it's not the case in Central Asia, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, Exim is the largest lender, both Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, and they just don't go, they just don't participate. And, you know, I, you know, my own explanation is that sort of the strategic borders with China make it as much of kind of an internal issue as an external issue. But you do have, I think, a, a kind of a, a more hardline stance on not coordinating um, in Central Asia than you do in some other parts of the world where you do see more interactions between the multilateral uh, community and the Chinese developmental community. Well, I guess the level of indebtedness of uh, Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan sort of explains uh, lack of tough stance. Um, so, and... Um, but I have a question to both of you, who should push for transparency? What would be the most promising, you know, avenues for action? So I, I think Alex mentioned this earlier, but I'd second his, his point about the importance of civil society. Um, and, you know, to the extent that, um, uh, you know, journalists can be empowered to, to cover more of this, I think that's one way to approach it. Um, you know, I think that uh, that that you know the recipient countries ultimately need to be the ones to say, um, you know, we're going to do these projects under our standards. You know, I think that the Chinese government has been um, sometimes willing to raise standards if if pressured to by the recipient country, but they're not going to do that unilateral unilaterally if not if not asked to do it. I don't think. Um, and there are some there are some cases in which I think the the recipient countries might have to pay a price for that. Might, there might be an additional cost in some of these projects 
um, to have, you know, a, a sort of a different approach. Um, and that's, you know, something that I think the, the broader international community might be able to help support. Yeah, I mean, I think these efforts need to be an organic part of already, you know, <laughs> civil society in many, many of these countries is, you know, is, is, is weak, <laughs> sometimes hanging on by a thread, but, but also remarkably resilient, right, in, 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 in the pressures of being known committed, I think it has to be part of organically what they do anyway, right? So one of the reasons the TBA power plant scandal, and not to get too much in the weeds, but this was a scandal in the winter of January 2018, where literally the power went off in Bishkek in the freezing cold temperature. And it was revealed through the episode that a Chinese, con uh, that, that, um, a Chinese uh, contractor who had received um, um, you know, the project uh, from um, you know, uh, D Development Bank uh, tender had not treated um, the boilers properly with chemicals that would resist the cold from the winter, right? And then, as journalists dug even more, it was exposed that Kyrgyz parliamentarians who had approved uh, the project, um, even though the bid itself, its terms were uh, not as competitive as some other bidders, um, had gone to China <laughs> on sort of kind of a goodwill uh, kind of trip. So, so what was so powerful about that was that it implicated a real cost domestically. Like people were literally freezing as a result of this you know, breakdown in governance and the lack of oversight by their own parliament. And I think when these kinds of, you know, narratives and this advocacy gets, um, you know, plugs into existing demands of accountability from officials within their committees and municipal structures and national structures, then, you know, that makes it much more powerful and conducive to the building of civil society overall, right? I'm certainly not advocating for like a special task force going after Chinese projects, you know, that's the wrong way, I think, to do it. Um, but I think, you know, the, 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 you know, the scandals that pick up most attention are things that are shown to sort of affect the lives of real people or narrated in that way. Well, well, uh, this case is a bit, it's quite controversial in a sense, who is, you know, who is to blame and, um, and uh, clearly the, the trial over the, uh, well, Sapari Sakov and the, uh, the other prime minister was not done properly and the evidence was not presented properly and they were sentenced to 15 and seven years, uh, if I remember correctly. Uh, and maybe, you know, the, it was mishandling of people in the plant that, that resulted in this, uh, in this accident. But, but anyhow, I think it's a very good uh, story to illustrate the use of corruption in the local political games. Uh, which, which you know, sort of, we should also keep uh, keep in mind. And it's, mm -hmm. it's given this narrative of uh, Chinese companies being, you know, kind of corrupt and uh, non-transparent and all that. It's a very kind of easy narrative to use. Um, and uh, well, and also, uh, I was wondering what you think about the uh, the. Uh, the role of state capacity in handling in handling these issues because you know we can have a vibrant civil society pushing for more transparency but if the government is not capable of processing and making the right decisions assessments and and so on then then it would you know not be uh, terribly useful um, either as actually the case of Kyrgyzstan uh, shows us and we have yeah we don't have much time but uh, if you could uh, reflect on that a little bit Sure. I mean, state capacity, yes, of course, um, you know, in terms of, you know, oversight and regulatory structures and apparatus. I, I would say in Kyrgyzstan in particular, the bright spot is taking it down a governance level. In other words, the municipal level. I think you can actually have quite flexible, quite capable, quite responsive municipal governance that looks into, um, you know, the terms of a lot of these contracts or how they're being implemented that can take and process feedback and whistleblowers, you know, much more quickly uh, than, the, than the state. So I think within these local governance structures and the more adaptable ones, and I think the ones, you know, that are relatively modern and, you know, trying to plug into best standards, you know, Almaty, um, Bishkek certainly, um, you know, that they can actually take the lead uh, uh, in, 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 you know, in some of these spheres. 
John, you compare different countries. I mean, there are all these countries in your database. Uh, what what are your what what is your analysis uh, on the issue of state capacity importance and what can be done to increase this capacity? Yeah, I mean, again, critical. Um, and I think you know, it's obviously it's always better when um, the the sort of the effort for more attention and investment and scrutiny comes from within, um, but. You know, there have been a handful of cases where I think um, international aid or, or capacity building support has had a positive impact. Um, it, you know, and one example outside the region that I think we're supposed to be focusing on today. Um, but in Myanmar, there was a port that was, the, you know, that was estimated to cost, I think, $7.2 billion. Um, and, you know, a team of um, lawyers was, international lawyers was sent to review the project on behalf of the government they realized, you know, that this is really not what they needed. Um, they're still going ahead with the project, but at a smaller scale, you know, about 1.2 billion. Um, and so that's a, you know, it was a pretty minor expense in the grand scheme of things to send that team to provide support um, for, you know, a really significant savings. Um, so I, I do think that those, that type of assistance um, should be made available you know, I think that there's there are political challenges involved with some of it. Um, and so, you know, it, it is, I think, when possible, worth strengthening, you know, institutions that will be perceived as more objective and not pushing some sort of ulterior motive onto um, this, these review processes. Um, but that, that's another another tool that is in the realm of what's feasible um, and I think could have a positive impact. Mm -hmm. And who should set, set the standards? You think multilateral organizations uh, should lead the effort, or? Well, so I think there, there's been, yeah, there's been a positive, at least on the infrastructure side. There's been some progress in the G20 with the quality infrastructure principles. But as I mentioned, I think there's more to be done to take those um, and to make them easier to implement. Um, and you know, the G20, while important, is not the whole world, right? And so you could imagine. Um, uh, you know, attempting to kind of build broader support for those, or you could just say, this is, we've got enough agreement here. Let's try to make it easier for others to adopt these and use them. Um, but I, you know, I think it's going to depend sometimes on the technology that we're talking about in terms of the specific standards and where they're set. Um, and I think, again, it's going to fall to recipient countries to say what standards they want to follow. Um, yeah, when they're having conversations with, with lenders. You didn't mention the Blue Dot Network that is also trying to set standards. Um, how promising is that? Yeah, I, yeah, I see that as a, again, as a positive, a part of a broader positive development where the, you see the US moving from criticism toward you know saying what it supports and trying to create alternatives. I think that there are still some operational challenges with that idea. Um, and more work that needs to be done to both um, bring on the partners and to make it a, a truly, you know, international effort um, and to operationalize the basic idea, which is to, to certify projects. Um, and the hope is that in providing that, that stamp of approval, you might be able to attract more private sector support. Um, you know, there, this is something that has been talked about a lot. It's, it's you know, challenging. Um, and so I think if it if it's going to be done successfully, we're looking at really a multi-year effort um, that's going to have to have its own capacity, and that's going to take an investment. Thank you so much. Uh, well, to 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 sum it up, um, China's Belt and Road Initiative is creating this kind of connectivity among us too, connectivity of concerns and challenges, and you know. Uh, and efforts to address address these uh, these issues. So I think we had an excellent discussion, and we are right on time. So I want to thank um, thank the, our excellent uh, panelists, uh, Professor Cooley, Dr. Hillman, uh, for their excellent inputs, and I want to thank the audience who watched us today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our pleasure. Thank you. <laughs>